-hmm. Well, welcome to the last round of all round tables. <laughs> As you see, we are in a square room. That's perfect for the idea that we wanted. So you are in front of us, we are in front of you. The idea was just beginning to debate, to discuss, to speak about the something that we don't know really the name. It uh, starts as the creation of a special group for CAA about things that we were doing more or less around simulation of things. But of course there are here plenty of simulations. Everything here in this conference simulating the past. You have 3D simulations, you have uh, special simulations, and I think simulation is not probably the best word for explaining what we are trying to do. We have also the word of complexity, and for the moment we are more or less using the word complexity, but when we began to contact people for, for beginning the debate, we found that the idea of complexity is too complex, and too many people have completely different approaches to complexity. In fact, any aspect of social sciences is complex, so complexity maybe is not the proper word. So we are looking for that. We are trying to recreate societies and social mechanisms, if you accept this expression. We want to use the computer as a tool, as a language, not for understanding the perceived nature of archaeological observables, but to understand social dynamics, how people created material things, how people produced things, how people killed people, how people did things in the past. This is the real question of archaeology, of history, of anthropology, of any discipline that you are practicing. The computer is a tool because for us it changed completely the way of understanding our discipline. For the first time we have a simulacra of a surrogate of a society. And we can make questions to this virtual society. Of course, around this question, there are plenty of meta questions. Is real? Is really the proper way of understanding that? Are there other ways of doing this analysis? And of course, the solutions come from different domains. So our idea was to invite some people from different domains from real computer science, from pure archaeology, if it exists, from uh, geographical analysis or anthropological analysis. Probably with this different approach, we can begin to understand things. So this is the first round table. The idea is to begin to discuss. We want to create a special group. The day of the plenary meeting will be the formal votation if you agree to have a special group. And this special group want to have many activities around that. Activities like debate, like this one. Activities about publishing. Activities about organizing parallel conferences and also additional conferences. And understanding you. Because it's not a question that a couple of people have some ideas and try to explain. But if really we find what complexity, what <coughs> simulation really is, is with the John work of all to that. So we have organized more or less in a very schematic way this, this meeting for having ideas, for discussing ideas. This we will present, we'll give, we'll give a general overview about the starting point of that, and then our selected speakers will begin the debate, will make questions, will provoke all of you to find the proper solution. So Isa, you have the yeah. word. All right, uh, so I'm just gonna give a very quick overview on what we're actually on about. Oh, sorry. Mm. Okay, uh, yeah. All right, so we are proposing the uh, new CAA special interest group. And the group will be in complex system simulation and archaeology. Uh, this is a very wide name, but it actually has kind of the core meaning and then the associated meaning, which I will explain. So to, to go into what, what we actually want to do, we have to explain what is the complex system simulation. And 
In very, very simple terms, it's using simulation, which is a very specific uh, scientific technique in which we build simplified models of, uh, of the real system. So at least we build what we think the past system looked like. And then we run them over time. So it has, it's not a static uh, model. It's actually a dynamic model that may change, evolve, uh, and, and in that process show us specific insight into, into the past or the same with uh, modern systems. So this is a particularly good tool for studying changes and, uh, and uh, complex interactions in the, past, in the past systems because it's a formal model, it's a formal method, uh, which means everything's explicit and, uh, and we have full control over the environment in which we simulate. Uh, but at the same time, we can also add stuff, stuff like uh, uncertainty or uh, test different factors and different variables. So this is very multidisciplinary because you have to have the knowledge of the context, you have to understand the data to be able to validate your simulation, but you also need to be able to code, which is not something we are taught generally in archaeology. Um, and the result is that we create those virtual labs where we can test our ideas. So instead of hypothesizing, just like we normally do when we interpret the data or when we produce new conceptual models, we can actually do it in a formal environment. So this, the special interest groups, uh, special interest group, uh, we want to focus on three things uh, because we think they are the key ones. So first of all, we want to bring the community together, and there are a few things that we want to do. Um, uh, in that in that vein, uh, to start with, we have a full <coughs> room on this fantastic afternoon when it's sunny outside and this beautiful medieval town outside. So there's clearly enough interest. I, I think uh, the time has come for CAA to get a special interest group in something that so many many people are interested in. So one of the things we're, we're really going to strive for yeah. is uh, uh, to have uh, continuity in the sessions, in the modeling sessions at CAA. Uh, international, so that you can be pretty sure that there will be a modeling simulation session every year. Uh, they may be in different topics, they may look at different aspects of simulations, but there will be something, so uh, so there will be a forum to present. And that may be connected to an annual, for example, to an annual um, special interest group uh, meeting or something else. There's also other conferences which uh, in different forms expressed interest in, in having archaeologists because modeling is a big field. So biologists do it, physics do it, chemistry does it. So uh, in some of the modeling conferences, they just go into the full multidisciplinary uh, way. And archaeology is one of those big gaping black holes of not being there. So um, that is slowly changing. And, uh, and we think that we can bridge that gap. Um, we want to uh, bring people together because, because the time is right for that. Uh, create collaborations between archaeologists, between uh, modelers. Modelers are often archaeologists, but sometimes they're computer scientists or mathematicians or come from other disciplines. And that's why we set up a mailing list. If you want to lie, if you would like to be added to the mailing list, please do and come to see me and I'll give you my card and I will set you up. Uh, it's, it's just one of those platforms where people just keep in touch and know what's going on. And uh, there are already some outlets that we would like people to contribute to and, you know, you know, we're not competition to them in any way. There's the open IBM platform where people put their code. There's a simulating complexity blog, which uh, kind of shares what's going on in the complexity and simulation world in archaeology. So we are not competing with them. It's all complementary. So there we go. Um, training, taking on new members. There's one thing you need to know and you need to be able to do in order to do simulations, and that's coding. And that sounds way scary, but I just, I just picked up, I went on Google and I just put coding for kids and I mean, if five-year-olds can learn it, we can learn it, everyone can learn it. It's actually much easier than people think. Uh, so one of our aim is to uh, break this barrier, this mental <laughs> barrier that, oh my God, I'm not a coding person, um, uh, by giving workshops in uh, simple simulation tools and perhaps in a longer run organizing a longer training sessions where we can teach people, for example, more complicated tools and uh, get them up to speed. And finally, um, and finally, we would like to just make sure that complexity, that uh, simulation becomes part of just the standard toolkit that people consider when they when they approach their research questions. 
at the moment, people usually just look at data analysis, GIS, you know, the standard techniques. We want simulation to become one of them. Uh, and we do have this uh, neat idea of having a new format for CIA conference, which uh, we'll propose to the steering committee, of having drop-in sessions where uh, you meet one-to-one -one with an expert, you tell them what you want to do, and they kind of kick you, kick start you. So they tell you where to look for for resource, what tools would be the most most appropriate. Uh, has anyone done something like that before? Or uh, you know what literature to, to look into? And that should that should speed up the process and and remove some of the steep learning curve that a lot of people are afraid of. So if you want to get involved, um, there's a mailing list. Please do and see me about that. Um, you can follow the archaeological uh, modeling uh, blog simulating complexity. Um, and if there's any way in which you would like to get involved, organizing events, uh, having some ideas, uh, putting together publications, finding collaborators, just come and see one of us and uh, yeah, we'll do our best to help. <coughs> All right, so the plan for today is to actually have some discussions. So I know we're in a lecture theater and, uh, and everyone feels like as if it was the undergrad course and there's one speaker. We don't even have enough chairs for all the panelists, but uh, we're just gonna purge them around the room, I guess. Uh, please don't be afraid to, to, to say what you think, uh, ask questions. Uh, we're not gonna laugh as long as you don't say anything funny. If you say something funny, we will. Um, and we will start with uh, three speakers which who we chosen because we believe they represent um, the, the future. <laughs> okay, I represent the future as well. <laughs> Everyone represents the future, but we discuss the past. Um, we chose them because we think uh, there are certain ways into people coming into simulation. We think one of the ways is through GIS when you when you realize that the static analysis is not enough and you want to make it dynamic. And that's just a tiny, tiny step to go into <laughs> simulations. The other one is um, is to make all of us you know, aware that a lot of computer scientists are coming in and then we will have way more collaboration that, are, that is truly interdisciplinary with, with you know, specialists in, in, in different fields. And also, it is, a, it is not a new technique, but it's relatively uncommon in archaeology and and we do have to crush through the for the threshold when the moment we have enough people doing it <coughs> nobody will be able to uh, to to ignore us which happens quite often now um, and I think more and more people will be picking it up and uh, critically engage with it so I would like to start with uh, with Fulko Sherian who will be our first speaker if that's right <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Isa. Thank you, Juan, for the invitation. I'm one of those coding people. I'm formally educated as a computer scientist. I will sit down, makes it easier for me. And um, I was invited here to discuss a little bit about um, how I see simulations, modeling, and archaeology, the combination thereof. So I decided to give you um, first, now well, an introduction to myself, I would like to give you some guidance, tips from a software developer, some easy things that everybody knows and <coughs> many people forget. So I would like to stress some of these basic principles and then I will talk a little bit about simulations, complex systems, and I would like to leave uh, a more or less provocative statement on how I see simulation in archaeology. Uh, first of all, um, I work at the Human Origins Department, uh, Leiden University. Uh, I do large-scale simulations in a, what I call realistic landscape. Um, my research aim at the current moment, my research is hominin space. Uh, I will be presenting that tomorrow for those interested. Uh, the thing is that I do an agent-based model in a realistic landscape. That's my background for simulation and archaeology. Um, I do a detailed landscape, reconstruction, parameterized model, and uh, comparison with archaeological data. Much of this sounds familiar to you, but this is my modeling field. Um, it's an agent-based model. Uh, first of all, from software development, 
there are specific phases. I think you will recognize these when you build a model. Um, these phases uh, are essential in each step. Each step is essential in the modeling. Uh, I want you to um, remember that these phases can be identified and should be used. Some very simple guidelines that everybody can use is uh, use version control. That gives you the ability to retrace your steps, make correct mistakes, things like that. Standardize what you do, very, very essential. Uh, organize and structure. It's something that all think, well, I do that, but when you look at your, critically look at what you do, there is always more to organize and always more to structure. People think that is not useful, but in the end, it will help you. Peer review is one of the most essential elements <coughs> of good software development. Let somebody else look at your code and look at your program, and they will <laughs> identify things that you never thought of. Agile programming, meaning quick, uh, go back to what is intended, show what you made, and go back to the computer room where you can program whatever is required. But make it quick, that is what works. Build up from the bottom and use well-tested building blocks. I'll come back to that point a little bit later on. Um, two things that I would like to offer you. Half your application come from repl replication. I think you all know this, but this means that what you are going to do probably has been done partly or more than partly. You can find it, some, most of it on the internet. But it also means that your stuff will be used, at least partly. Uh, that means that you have to think about the future, your own future, where you work with your own stuff, but also where other people work with it. So remember that. And the second thing is the lesson of pi. Um, it's not this one. I think you will. It's this one. And then you think, what does he? What is this? Uh, this means that when you ask uh, a complex computer application to be built, um, let the people make a formal specification of what they need. How much time, how much money, how much manpower, and multiply this with three. That gives you a proper estimation of what's going to happen. This is lesson from <laughs> lesson learned from experience. Multiply by three, and that means it takes three times longer and costs three times as much. That might be a consolidation for some of us. Um, Archaeology and simulation, we are reaching maturity, at least um, Mark Lake has uh, put it that way. Um, this is the number of times that simulation is mentioned in the abstract, not specifically in the <coughs> title of the research. These are published papers. Uh, you can see a clear and pretty steep incline. Methodological maturity from 2010 until now. I come back to this graph, remember this graph. Um, simulation is a form of abstraction that gives us uh, several additional tools or methodologies uh, that we can use when we are analyzing our archaeological data and where we are, when we try to rebuild our past. Um, first of all, building simulations, can we call that a science? For now, I will leave that question for the discussion. Uh, I think it's something that we should look into. Is this real science or not? But simulation adds to archaeology. It gives us the possibility for replication, which is essential. It gives you the reproducibility of some of the events that we are interested in. Um, it gives you an experimental room. We already mentioned, we went into that. Um, we give you a possibility to explore alternatives. These are elements that are missing in archaeology. Um, not all of them are being missed, and that's something that we should do something about, I think. But um, it adds to archaeology. These are the tools that we think, I think, archaeology needs. Um, I would like to mention one thing, um, and that is what I see as a similarity between agent-based modeling between software development and between <laughs> complex systems. Uh, and that is uh, what we call the black box. A complex system could be seen as an, uh, a black box where there is no linear relation between input and output. 
Uh, the, from the output, you cannot deduce the input. Um, and this happens also in software development and uh, um, especially in agent-based modeling. And I think with this, we have one key of understanding uh, a complex society. Society is generally seen as a complex system and there is no linear relationship between input and output. So it's not easy to understand these systems. Agent-based modeling maps onto that perfectly well. Um, I think that's an, one of the main advantages of agent-based modeling. Okay, <coughs> this is about agent-based modeling. I think, well, um, society, is it agent-based? We don't know. There are people who say that institutions within society define what people can do. I don't believe in that. So my viewpoint is that it is agent-based. That means that the methodology of agent-based modeling can be applied to analyzing complex systems. And I think we all agree that society is complex. Mm, some of it is, I think in general, we can say that society and people are complex entities. So I would say that uh, understanding society can be done by agent-based modeling. Um, and software development as a black box can help with that. Okay, but I would like to go into what I would like to, uh, s well, it's a controversial viewpoint. Creating simulations is easy. Uh, everything is readily available from the internet. Everybody can find examples and you can find the code that you need. Uh, but modeling, the essential element of modeling is about the validity of your model. Your model must be applicable to what you are researching. That's something that we tend to forget when modeling is as easy as it is now. And this validity, this definition of validity is not a science. It's very, it's not straightforward to prove the validity of your model. It's also a complex process. It's, McLeod has called it an art. Uh, I can support that. Art is not very objective. That means that the validity of your model is not scientifically proven to be correct. Then we come to, uh, should we simulate? I think we all in this room would agree. <coughs> yes, yes, but there is always a but. Um, I put this in a previous version a little bit stronger. Um, I think we should at least manage the use of simulation. And I think that what Isa mentioned the drop-in sessions would be a very good instrument uh, at least to um, moderate some of the applications of simulation. Why do I mention this? But uh, remember the graph that I showed you about simulations in archaeology. Uh, in computer software development, we had such graphs in the past. Um, there was a need for new programs and for many programmers that were not available. At that point in time, everybody started programming. And I think we are about to recover from that disaster. If everybody simulates, you get, sorry for the word, crap simulations. And that could be um, very bad for <coughs> our field of studies. Uh, that's something I would leave to ponder. I leave it to this. Um, those are really good points, and I think uh, there will be a lot of discussion going on. Uh, you promised that uh, you're going to say something that uh, I'm going to disagree with, but uh, that hasn't happened. So I guess that's some good news. Uh, yes, 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 yes. I think maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, okay. This, well, this last point about managing the simulations. I think it is not about encoding. It's oh, about managing. Okay. Okay. Now, now I do that's disagree. That's where the uh, <laughs> disagreement could be. Okay. So that was a fantastic point for. Uh, we're gonna do the massive discussion after uh, our three panelists uh, and their presentations. If that's all right. Um, I would like to invite uh, our second panelist. Uh, Andrea Di Andrea, um, who will uh, tell us about um, about 
innovation in archaeology and how yeah. new techniques come. Where are we? Here we go. Do you want to go to the Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Juan and uh, Isa, for inviting me to, uh, to present some, uh, uh, I think, principle about uh, uh, an archaeological point of view about uh, a simulation. So I, I will address uh, my, uh, my talk uh, uh, to non-archaeologists that are uh, in, this, uh, in this room, because I think that uh, if we want to create uh, an horizontal uh, special group, uh, it's necessary to know each other which is uh, the starting point uh, of uh, our uh, discussion in order to uh, avoid uh, uh, misunderstanding that uh, uh, are always uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, our, uh, in our research. So I would, uh, I would like to start uh, with very, very uh, key point, uh, point of view the, uh, about, uh, about uh, our, uh, our mission, our vision in, uh, in archaeology. Uh, archaeologists are familiar, since a long time, are familiar with the world uh, uh, like uh, simulation, uh, prediction, modeling, uh, uh, and also uh, archaeologists uh, since uh, 16 and uh, 17 uh, tried to explain uh, the archaeological uh, uh, artifacts, archaeological collection uh, uh, through uh, general theory. Why? Uh, because uh, we need uh, to understand uh, which is uh, the relationship uh, between the static of the archaeological data and the dynamic uh, about the process that we want to analyze, that we want to reconstruct uh, and rebuild. So it's, uh, it's uh, a very uh, key point how we can transform, how we can uh, manage static information and transform them in a dynamic uh, information. So this is the, 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 the I, I think the, the, the main task that our colleagues in, in 16 and 17 tried to, to solve uh, using uh, simulation, not always by computers, but also uh, by using a general theory, and uh, how is possible to compare through this, uh, this approach different uh, communities uh, in order to understand the evolution, transformation, change <laughs> in time and, uh, and space. This is a very old uh, diagram uh, provided by Binford uh, about uh, how is possible to, uh, to have uh, a general theory and how is possible to, uh, to try to check and to validate this, uh, this theory through another middle uh, theory that uh, um, um, including different, uh, different law, different rules, uh, in order to establish a sort of a casual linkage between static material and dynamic, uh, dynamic values. So uh, there is a very long uh, history about the simulation in, uh, in archaeology. And, um, it is important to, to uh, highlight that uh, archaeologists try to find a sort of a, a middle, middle, I think not uh, hardware or software, middle things, middle uh, reasoning about how it's possible to convert the static information in uh, dynamic uh, data. And uh, in, uh, in the, in the um, uh, beam for the theory, we have uh, uh, four different uh, levels. The first one uh, is based on this linkage between uh, static and dynamic uh, information. These are archaeological uh, uh, data. We can, uh, we can, uh, co uh, we can collect uh, fragments, scattered from fragment, broken or unbroken uh, fragment. We can analyze the landscape uh, a uh, different scale, micro or micro scale. Uh, we have uh, buildings, we have walls, uh, uh, not always well uh, preserved. So this is our uh, point, starting point. So uh, always uh, a process start from this kind of uh, uh, archaeological data. So archaeologists need to transform this in, ar in archaeological process. 
In the left side, we have uh, uh, a sort of a list, not a uh, uh, complete list of uh, archaeological static, uh, static records, ceramics, uh, small findings, uh, cemeteries, but we have also different uh, methodology that we can use to have information, to extract information, to collect information. We can use uh, a surface uh, collection, a random surface, uh, a test survey, an, esca an excavation on open area, a trench. So it's important to, to link correctly the static record to the methodology, because you can have a different <coughs> meaning if you approach uh, in a different way the data collection. At the end, we have different archaeological processes that we can infer from our data. For instance, production of materials, uh, circulation, exchange, market, and so on. We, we can also define public uh, or private space. I think that we manage uh, special information uh, before the, the introduction of GIS. So always uh, archaeologists manage uh, process, uh, al always archaeologists manage simulation. So now maybe our task uh, is uh, made much more uh, easy, but is not uh, really a uh, revolution. It's, it's important for us uh, to have this uh, distinguished level of information. So how is possible to transform a static archaeological process in a dynamic past? Dynamic past means that we want to analyze the change in time, the change in, uh, in space, the change in, uh, in different uh, uh, way to uh, organization of the landscape, organization of the, 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 the territory and so on. And the archaeologists uh, use this uh, uh, hermeneutics uh, uh, approach, this circle, because uh, we have data, because we are able to distinguish uh, model, but the model are uh, influenced by uh, theory. But uh, in the, in, uh, there, is also a, a, there is also a way uh, that we can uh, modify theory uh, on the base of data. So, for this reason, we have uh, a circle. In, uh, uh, thanks to the digital, uh, digital uh, application, digital uh, uh, tool, we can add other information. So we have not one model, but also a, model, a digital model that can, that can uh, influence uh, data and digital data. So uh, our model is much more uh, uh, complex. The problem is uh, more or less the same. We want to transform static in dynamic. How is possible? Because we need to have a very good analysis of our data, and primarily because we need to codify correctly to make explicit our assumption about data. This is important. This is the first step of our simulation. Uh, to force archaeologists to have a clear meaning of their uh, data. Also, we need to, to transform this assumption in terms of a comparison between different uh, states, different periods, different uh, sentiment. We, we need to, to compare them in order to extract, to infer, for instance, uh, uh, behaviors, behaviors changing in, uh, in, in time. And to reach this, uh, this aim, uh, it's necessary to have uh, a scientific language in order to have uh, scientific uh, observation. So the, uh, it's necessary to have a clear language to transform uh, this uh, archaeological information in a dynamic, uh, in dynamic uh, simulation. And to reach uh, this, uh, this, uh, this task that is not so easy, we need uh, to introduce uh, in, uh, in our, uh, in our uh, discussion, in our approach, uh, rules. Why we transform, why the, the community uh, pass from state A to state B through different rules that uh, we need to uh, establish, to fix, uh, and to, uh, to uh, analyze. This is a, a, a sort of a, a schematic way uh, about uh, a, a typical simulation approach. I have uh, a known state uh, A, I have uh, another known state B. How this community transform itself in another, in another uh, level, in another uh, condition? So 
in my opinion, uh, agent-based modeling can help us uh, to understand, uh, the, through this uh, computer simulation, this uh, uh, transformation, this change from different, uh, different states. And to reach uh, this, uh, this aim is important to uh, have good uh, rules, um, sometimes based on the environment, have good uh, uh, indexes, uh, parameters about demography, for instance, about the, the capacity of the, uh, of, the, of the land, the demographic indices, and so on. So we can uh, uh, reformulate the, the, the initial the, uh, di diagram provided by uh, Binford in 1977, <coughs> and uh, in, in this uh, la uh, last uh, information about uh, uh, knowledge of past dynamics. So simulation can help uh, us to test and to evaluate uh, inferences, to uh, recompose, uh, reconcile the, the gap between uh, empirical product and abstractions, to overcome a generic uh, relationship between uh, uh, settlement and uh, uh, landscape, and hopefully uh, we need to, uh, to use ABM approach in order to have a new explanation theory. This uh, is, uh, in synthesis, uh, our approach from static, from uh, material, from fragments. We reach, we reach indices, we reach parameters, uh, and we can uh, demonstrate how, the, um, how this uh, specific uh, community uh, transform in, uh, in the past. So, my, um, I conclude my uh, Introduction just to highlight that uh, we have a long history in the simulation. Archaeologists has, uh, have, uh, are aware about this, uh, this scope of their uh, uh, science. It is important also that other uh, experts are aware that we have a long history in this specific uh, field of research. Thank you. This is beautiful. The computer scientists say, don't simulate, the archaeologists say. Yeah, simulate everyone. <laughs> so let's find some middle grounds. Perhaps? Perhaps? Well, uh, up to you. Um, so uh, Thomas, who is a specialist in GIS, turned modeler, uh, will probably tell us more about the middle ground. Sorry. Oh, <coughs> Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank uh, Isa and Juan for inviting me to speak at this uh, roundtable. And to give you a little bit of background um, about myself, I do large-scale GIS modeling. And um, I've been doing that for a long time. And um, it's not agent-based modeling exactly, but agency is implied in it. And um, agency is carried out through a lot of map algebra. And um, so sometimes I tend to think in terms of map algebra and not specifically English. So <laughs> if I sound a little com confusing sometimes, that's because I'm confusing myself. But um, I wanted to touch on some basic underlying theoretical issues. My, I completely agree with what uh, Andrea and Folco said earlier. In fact, Andrea stole my point about um, middle range theory because I also believe that um, simulation can be middle range theory. And as, a particularly good approach to doing it. And um, I wanted to sort of get at the theoretical basis that underlies all of um, simulation and archaeology. And one thing I want to um, bring up is the idea that, in fact, uh, this approach is not particularly new. We've been doing um, analog forms of simulation for a long time, because experimental archaeology is that exactly. And um, the, uh, going back to the 1940s and 1950s, when lithic specialists were recreating the ways in which tools were manufactured, you know, how, to, how they manufactured a Clovis point, for example. You know, this is simulation in archaeology, and it's been around for a long time. We just have new, certain new techniques uh, by which to apply the approach. Um, additionally, there are things like... Um, uh, Civil War recreations that are analog forms of simulation. Uh, the people who every year recreate the Battle of Gettysburg in the U.S., for example, these are agent-based modelers. They're agents running around on the landscape, and they're recreating the Battle of Gettysburg. 
But one thing I want to point out is that, in fact, this is not a recreation or a replication of the Battle of Gettysburg because nobody's getting killed during these recreations. You know, it's not authentic in that way. You can't have the Battle of Gettysburg again. You know, it will never exist again because you, ask, you have to have the entire context and the entire social and political context, and that won't exist again. We have a different social and political context now. So no matter <laughs> what we do as archeologists with simulation, we're not recreating the past, we're creating our own version of the past. And uh, when somebody recreates a Clovis point, it's not actually a Clovis point. It's, it's not even a replica of a Clovis point. It's something that we think a Clovis point looks like. And um, so that's something to bear in mind whenever we're doing simulation. So when we think about the ways in which we do simulation, we've already covered the notion that um, it's not modeling. Modeling tends to be a static process. You're, ex you're creating one model and it's not changing. Simulation is a dynamic process and you're looking at iterations and a series of models, essentially. The simulation is made up of multiple models building into it. But why do we do simulation? Um, there's a, a wide range of, of people who are simulating in various ways out there and I think that there are uh, essentially four different things that people are doing with um, either simulation of some kind or agent-based modeling. And um, the first thing is, and you see this with a lot of papers uh, so far, a lot of papers that I've seen at the CAA so far, um, where people are essentially creating models in order to um, uh, apply new methodologies. It's really a methodological study. They're, they're creating, and I've done this many times as well, you're creating a model not so much to answer a question, but to develop a process for creating that model. And that's where we are in many ways with agent-based modeling. We're experimenting with different approaches to creating models. So methodology or creating a methodology is the outcome that's expected um, from the model in the first place. <clears throat> Additionally, a lot of people work in three-dimensional immersive models, and they call them simulations. And I, I kind of tend to just think of them as models. They're not really simulations, even though that's a term we tend to use for that um, immersive environment. The only thing that's being simulated is the ability to walk around in this three-dimensional space. Um, what they're doing is they're reconstructing their, um, their interpretation of the past, and they're dealing with uh, building uh, buildings, um, landscapes, um, uh, material culture, uh, environments, atmospheres. They're creating these, these things that represent uh, an immersive space, but uh, they're only ever presenting it from the perspective of one agent, the person who's viewing the computer screen. And um, that is a very useful, very um, positive technique. It's very uh, useful specifically for pedagogy. It's very useful for teaching people what your interpretations of the past are. But um, when you're doing a 3D reconstructive immersive model, you're not generally, you're not asking um, explanatory questions. You're not asking things about uh, people's behavior in the past. You are providing an environment within which people can get their own experience of that. Um, another uh, use of uh, modeling that I see very frequently, specifically with agent-based modeling, is uh, data mining. People are creating models in which they set up some parameters and create some populations of agents and they go out and populate either the, the uh, uh, simulated manifold or an actual realistic landscape. And they don't have any specific ideas in mind of what's going to happen. They just want things to evolve and an organization to emerge. And then from that, um, they develop, they see patterns that they recognize. They use pattern recognition. And um, the important thing about when you're doing that kind of modeling is that that pattern recognition then feeds into building explanatory questions or hypotheses. And then you can model that again and look at how do we explain those processes. So w the way I approach modeling um, from my GIS perspective really is to look at it from an explanatory perspective. I'm looking at what, is, what human behavior is going on and how do we explain that. And I come from a causal mechanical um, background in terms of explanatory theory. And um, that's the idea that um, you don't use laws to make explanations about human behavior. You don't use thick description or um, uh, 
ideas that you just described what's going on, I think what you do is you build a causal mechanism. Um, how we explain behavior in the past is that everything that we do as an activity is a mechanism of some kind. And I work specifically in, in human energetics, so I'm looking at the expenditure of, of kinetic energy um, through the acquisition of potential energy and then lost energy and, and looking at this across the landscape <clears throat> and comparing um, outcomes based under different parameters. But um, I think that when we look at uh, whatever kind of simulation you want to do, explanation is an extremely important element and that's where the middle range theory ideas come in and that um, simulation itself is a middle range explanation for human behavior. When you use another analogy, um, I tend to think in analogies. So uh, uh, imagine that you're um, an archaeologist and you're walking around and you're identifying a highway landscape. And along this highway, there's a lot of um, uh, discarded, broken parts of automobiles. Um, and you're an archaeologist, so your, your job is to, to collect these little bits and pieces of automobiles and reconstruct what an automobile looked like. However, we all know that there are parts of the automobile that are not preserved for numerous um, reasons, either it's perishable material or post-depositional processes. We also know that these parts don't fit the same automobiles. They're from different cars, from different time periods. There are also some pieces that are very common and some that are extremely rare. So it becomes really difficult to, to reconstruct an automobile. And even if you did reconstruct an automobile, it's not one that existed in the past and had a life of its own. It's a, a modern day example of something that you think that automobile looked like. And what we're interested in modeling for simulations is the notion of uh, recreating something like the uh, internal combustion engine. That's an even more difficult process. Um, if you, you have the ability to use um, computer simulation to reconstruct um, an engine, then you have to think about um, what's the purpose of your reconstructing of this engine. Is it, is this, if you're going to reconstruct this mechanism of an internal combustion engine, is it going to tell you about where people actually drove that vehicle down the highway and why they drove it down there? Is it going to tell you how they felt while they were driving that vehicle? No, I mean, the, the questions are different. So simulation is useful for a lot of things and it's useful for understanding mechanisms but it's not necessarily going to get at the processual or post-processual questions that um, we all deal with on, on some level. And we have to put it into a larger context. And um, uh, I think that uh, there are uh, additional things that we need to consider in that, uh, in that vein. One is the idea of <coughs> incorporating um, perception and prediction into our um, simulations. Uh, we have to realize that when we're creating a simulation um, and we're creating agents in the computer or if you're doing it through map algebra, um, the way that you're dealing with um, whatever the parameters are that you're looking at, what you're simulating is not the way the parameters are in the environment, but the way that people perceive of those parameters. So they may not be dealing with the full information that we have in a GIS or in a in a, um, an Asian-based model, they're dealing with their perception of that. So there are certain things that you build in, like um, uh, information fall off. There may be uh, there may be some agents in your model that have more information than others. There may be agents that are dealing with, with very well-known information in a specific location, then it falls off to very much unknown information in others. So uh, we have to we have to build these into our simulations. And people in the past were not, uh, they, they weren't going in different directions or moving in locations based on information that they knew. They were basing it on their predictions about what um, information that they knew and the information that they gathered from other um, agents. So uh, that brings in the idea of um, either, either over-parameterizing or under-parameterizing your models. So. Um, if, if we go back to the analogy of the Battle of Gettysburg, where agents are running around in the landscape and creating a, a reconstruction, their, their, their interpretation of the Battle of Gettysburg, if you built an agent-based model that set up some rules for how the agents behave, um, and you create a bunch of soldiers and you just let them loose on the landscape, and they throw their pen on the floor, if you just let them loose on the landscape and then see, see 
or expect to see them organize into military units, then you may be waiting a long time for that to happen. Um, you don't have enough parameters for that to work. So you have to essentially uh, put in the parameters of military organization, the command structure, chain of command, um, building in things like um, locations of artillery, how the artillery operates differently from uh, the infantry units, how the cavalry will operate differently, and you have to have the right number of parameters, but you can't over-parameterize it either. You can't have create a bunch of soldiers who run around on the landscape and then worry about the state of their uniform all the time. You know, the, the color of their, or their uniform buttons is not necessarily a parameter that you want to put into your model. So you want to be able to build this good balance between um, developing a model that has good explanatory questions that you're looking at um, has the right parameters and also um, operates in a way that um, can functionally give you some output that's going to be useful for you. And what I see a lot of times is people who are over emphasizing the methodology and the details of the information that they're providing to the model um, and not so much uh, worrying about what the explanatory questions are that they're addressing. And um, one of my favorite archaeologists um, from years past was the great American archaeologist George Kogel, who was one of the early mathematicians, statistical archaeologists. And he made the, the point one time um, that you don't need a Rolls Royce to pull a plow. So if you're going out and you're creating a Rolls Royce, you have to understand what you're using it for. If you're just going to pull a plow with it, if you don't have any explanatory questions, if you don't have really um, interesting information to get from your model, then why are you spending all of this time doing it? Um, the converse to that was he also said that um, the only thing you ever, the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything <laughs> starts to look like a nail. So you have to have the right tools in your toolbox and you have to employ them in the right way. So that's basically where I'd like to leave you. We don't even have enough chairs to sit all of our panelists, so I think we're just going to purge all over the room. Um, thank you so much for uh, for your presentations that really, I think, sketched out what we're on about. I think there are three major topics that are kind of begging to be discussed. Should we simulate? When should we simulate? And how should we do it? Agreed? I don't know if the proper word is simulate. I think one thing uh -oh, that... Oh, we're getting into some other no, no, no. <laughs> It's just a um, thing that I think what I have learned from, from, from our panelists is that the most important thing is not simulate because it is a call to the method. The most important thing is something that we have forgot. It's explain. When we are speaking about simulation, it's just explaining and how to use a method to help us explain it. The fourth is the question that we should manage simulation and not stimulate simulation. This is a question that Andrea said also. Please, uh, we are archaeology. We are looking for archaeological explanation. And Tom has also insisted on the idea of explaining. I think this is the absolutely key word, the core concept in our debate. What we are looking for is how to explain. Of course, with these three questions that Issa has uh, remarked, we should explain something that mm, is really a, a very good question in modern archaeology, because in most cases, explanation in history and archaeology is rejected. It's been rejected. Archaeology is not a science. History is not a science. I'm sorry, because Mother Eve is the most infectious mental illness <laughs> in the history of mankind. That's on the record now. <laughs> there is not a single way of explaining. I will accept with some ways of post-Mother in that sense. So we shall explain how we should explain. Because up to now, explanation has been narrative. So we are now obtaining a new language, a new set of procedures to help us explain. It's not the computer who explains. We are the people that we should explain. But it's so complicated and not only complex that not the archaeologists alone will explain their own data. 
We need a specialist in language. We need a specialist in <coughs> procedures. And all together, we can find the explanation and express the explanation. This is the second advantage of what we are doing. The explanation is no more a subjective explanation from a researcher. It's something that we are offering to all of you. That's uh, Foucault has said. Attention, simulation is something for everyone. For the first time, it's really uh, replicable, the explanation. It's not just an opinion of some researcher, but it can be replicated by other researchers. This is what we open now to the discussion. We open the discussion from all the points of view, from the methodological, but also from the theoretical point of view. <coughs> I think we should shut up because uh, we're, we're not making it to a round table at all. So um, you're, so you're just making the case to uh, expose our brains to the rest of the scientific community by um, using simulation. This is a really good point because uh, my supervisor once said that <laughs> simulation is a really elaborate thought experiment. That's all it is. There is. It doesn't give you any discovery science. It doesn't give you what the new data brings. It's not going to tell you if... Homo erectus arrived in Southeast Asia 1.8 million years ago because it won't. It's just gonna. It's just a thought experiment that is formalized so that uh, you can make it way more complex than if you were just thinking about it. Do you think there's another? Does anyone think that there's another technique in archaeology that would allow you to to test your hypothesis? I'll give you this. Just uh, to say that uh, we're going to be recording this out. <laughs> so if anyone doesn't want this out, what they say is recorded, just let me know and I'll turn it off. Okay. Sorry, um, I, I lost my thing about. Um, so does anyone think that there's another technique that uh, allows us to not get the snapshots of the past, but actually to formalize our theories and then compare them to the data? Because I think there are some, but. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> oh, this is tough. It's a question of opening the the idea. So, what we are discovering, explanation, is something mechanical, complex, complicated mechanisms, and therefore we are not looking for a single technique for a single approach, because what we should open is not only our minds but all the possibilities, because the explanation of any kind of social dynamic is not an easy task. We need very, very complex and complicated methods to approach any kind of explanation. And sometimes it's something that people from out of the simulation area don't understand. They think, OK, you are mechanic people, you are only using computers, and there is only an input-out mechanism too simple for real social sciences. And our idea is completely different. So we are open, we are creating a language. And this language comes from integrating different methods, different approaches, different techniques. Of course, we should look for testing, validation. I think Foucault has said perfectly, validation is not a science for the moment. <laughs> Probably we will simulate in a few years how we are simulating. And we will arrive to Matrix movies. So are we living into a simulation? Is really archaeology a simulation? I, I think Fulker was right that uh, the validation part, so comparing, well, knowing if your model actually represents what has happened in the past, it's an art. But I'm going to make a little drawing. Um, it's been a smart person <coughs> that I uh, don't remember, who said that the scientific stool has three legs, uh, and one of them is data. I mean, they actually said experiments, but we don't do experiments because all our people died. So it's <laughs> very unfortunate. Uh, so we have data instead. Uh, the, other, the other leg is the theory. So our conceptual models, how we think the past happened or the present system happens, and people come up with new creative ways. But there is one thing that you need in order not to kind of dangle on the, on the two leg stool, which is the simulation. Because that's what connects the, the theory to the data. It, it is the glue that makes, that makes that allows you to actually test your theory. So the mechanisms, the conceptual models, the, the kind of black box in between state A and state B 
I think I mixed two presentations now. Um, and then compare it to the data and actually see how how uh, how much they corroborate. corroborate. So um, I don't think we can go on very long without simulation, especially that this leg of a stool in archaeology is like this. <laughs> this one's, well, I'm in Paleolithic, so let me just say, well, <laughs> up to here. And uh, this is this is a precarious mode, really, way of dealing with it. So if we support it with this, we're fine. And therefore, the validation bit is just kind of part of the whole process. I mean, none of it is, we're not doing mathematics. None of it will be always, you know, will be for sure and ever. But as you increase the legs of the stool, you just gain more and more uncertainty. And that's why I think the problem of validation isn't that such a big problem. Coco, what do you think? Um, I disagree, <laughs> but, but you already know that. Um, I think <coughs> if that middle leg is essential, why is it missing so much? And simulation is not often Wasn't it about the postmodernism thing? <laughs> I think we can blame, <laughs> blame the lack of the middle leg of that. No. Well, no. I think validation is an essential element of Oh, I, I'm, not, I'm not questioning that. I'm and I saying. think also it's a very, uh, like I said, it was an art. Right? It's, it's very difficult to make certain that your model, your model is valid. And um, I think there's a lot of selling your model involved, that you can somehow convince people that your model is valid. And in selling stuff, I don't believe in it. So for me, there is mm -hmm. the key element where we must improve simulation. Yeah. Maybe it's less a case of uh, proving that your model is right than proving which models are wrong. That's something that simulation can definitely do. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I would like to add that every model is wrong. That's the problem with modeling. So it's very easy to say that your model is wrong because it's a, it's a simplification of the real world. So it's always wrong. Uh, but your simulation can provide proper answers and <coughs> you're still not sure if your model is right. That, that's, that's a bit of the issue. I'm not sure. See, this, is what where, like to this is where the art comes in, because yes. social sciences is always the art of convincing other people yeah. that you're right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm not sure art is really the right word, but I, but I don't think simulation is different from anything else we do. Yeah. That you always have to make an argument for the validity of your, uh, your ideas, your model, your theory, and um, you know, it's our job is to make those arguments convincing. Uh, in the case of uh, simulation, it means you have to really understand what the simulation is doing uh, and be willing to explain why that's what it should do. Um, and then, you know, but, but I think we have to do that with everything. And we just, the one thing we shouldn't do is run the simulation and say, there, see? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. No, 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 I think the boss was there, <laughs> first, second, third. Uh, what I would propose is uh, you can use simulations also as an exploratory tool uh, to uh, derive a theory. It's not only that you have a theory first and then, uh, 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 but uh, again, I'd like to stress the point that it's important to validate, validate uh, mm -hmm. your um, uh, results. No, 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 I, I never questioned that. Oh mm. my god, I'll never get for peer review now. <laughs> <laughs> I do validate my simulations. <laughs> and there's a tiny little problem of acting so that you can yeah. have uh, different uh, simulations uh, which all get you more or less the same Absolutely. Design. So one of the things about equiponality is uh, that, as you mentioned, well, conceptual models have the, exactly the same problem. So if you come up with three hypotheses, in exactly the same way with their narratives, you don't know if they wouldn't arrive at the same data pattern. So simulation is not the only technique that has a problem of equipenality. Uh, and I think we have to keep that in mind because every time I present my, my work, there will be always somebody saying, equipenality! <laughs> so we say, well, you know, it's not ideal. There may be other models that will, you know, corroborate with, with data better. However, 
let's keep in mind that you know we're not creating them at random. They are informed in our understanding of the past. And, and as much as this understanding may not be perfect, it's not that we're completely making it up. There are some bases for that. And it's not like, you know, free for all. I think uh, we may not be correct in everything, but it's also silly to question that we have some idea about the societies of the past. Yeah. Uh. And maybe a useful point is actually to contradict what, what Juan was saying a little bit, which is I think it's important to separate simulation and explanation. And I guess I think that's more or less what you're saying is that uh, when you present the simulation as if it were explanation, people get upset. And I think it's because you need to make uh, an argument from the simulation about why that can serve as explanation or what it tells you about explanation. And I think that's that. Uh, process of going from one to the other, I think, is a really something we don't want to, to collapse into the one step. Yeah, I understand the point there is a difference between knowledge and the exclusion of knowledge. <coughs> Following this, this question, I will suppose that theory here we have explanation, in here we have the model. But the question is what is explanation? Explanation is just a sentence, a proposition. Therefore, I understand. Theory explanation model in a very synonym way. Uh, for me, a model is the way we express an explanation. But once we have an explanation, what we can do with that? What is the real use of a model? So I understand simulation as using the model. How to use the model? I can use the model to give a lecture here using words. The best thing is to use the model inside the computer and then you can validate my model. I think this is the real use here. Instead of simulation, I would say using the model. Then we have the difference in data, of course. You have the explanation expressed in terms of a model. That means a formal explanation. And then we have the execution of this model. And we execute the model just for one single reason, because we want to validate the model. It will be my re-explanation of the three legs of the chair. Well, I think um, when we talk about analog simulations, we're talking about experimental archaeology. I mean, what you're talking about is experiment. That's what yeah. simulation is. It's experimenting with the explanation. Can you have Yeah. Um, as a non-specialist, normal archaeologist, uh, I think uh, we're all we are... Uh, <laughs> We, are, we fear the model because we don't understand it. And this black box you mentioned is, I guess, our problem. Would it be Latin or Etrusca or Hieroglyph? We'd be comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. But there it's this black box. You give your data and something comes out. And uh, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of pedagogy uh, with, within us so to understand what is possible, what not, what might be done, how. And uh, we cannot say, uh, oh, it's on Lightning, on, it's on GitHub, you just check the code, because it's not what archaeologists do. Uh, so uh, I think that's one point uh, which might be uh, important to develop. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And here I will bring back the controversial, should we simulate or should we manage simulations? Well, I think every technique has to go through the early early stage of the shitstorms of everyone producing really crap research, as you mentioned, because it just makes people used to that technique, so that they actually can critically engage with those because they've been trained on a, on a whole range of bad applications, and uh, GIS went for that, uh, 3D reconstructions went for that, <laughs> statistics went for that, where people were proving things. I'm not sure they'll all be covered for that. <laughs> I think we're slowly getting out of this. <laughs> so, so I think that the kind of the shitstorm phase of, of you know picking up a new technique is necessary <coughs> so that people that are not actually working with that technique know what to look out for, uh, and and you know so stand there and make sure that we don't do anything particularly stupid. Agreed. Yeah, it's going to be painful. Now, I, I, I would like to mention one thing. Archaeologists are very multidisciplinary. They are used to working with people of other disciplines yeah. and coordinating this. And that is the power of archaeology, actually. 
Uh, and I think if you work together with a specialist, uh, you will understand this black box. I think. Because you use a lot of black box. These are these all these all the other disciplines. You have no clue what it's all about. But it's the same for me. I was trained as a uh, paleolithic archaeology. If I was to make a model for, I don't know, for, for classical Rome, I would have amazing problems. I need this classical archaeologist to do this for me. And that works both ways. So I think that would be a solution for the black spot. And I think what ISA tells us is if there's enough if, if there's enough models and simulations in the literature, people get used to it. And if there's a way of <coughs> helping people to explain how this black box works or how to use such a black box, mm -hmm. I think we're getting to the point that simulations is a more or less accepted tool for that mm -hmm. or a specialization. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the uh, call for arms for all the reviewers of simulation papers. If you cannot understand, just make them rewrite it so until until you do understand. I think I think this it should come from both sides. I think though I think it's an argument that we aren't always going to understand black box. And that's where if you if you bring in ideas from you know complexity theory, um, the idea of emergence where where uh, unpredictable structure emerges from sort of uncoordinated behavior of, of agents. Um, we may I think what we can what we can do is understand what goes into it really well and what comes out of it really well. And that whole process of emergence may remain mysterious to some degree. You see, I would uh, disagree with that. I think because we use formal environment, you know, when we do conceptual models <laughs> and we say, oh, I think this pattern was caused by this, then we don't actually know how it was, what are the mechanics of that. However, because we have a formal environment, you can then, you know, break it and, and, and try one after another. And I think this is, simulation is the only tool to actually figure out what is in the black box. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with that. I mean, I think that's true, and I think you can get a lot closer to understanding it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure, maybe it's just me, but there are some things I'm pretty sure I'll never understand <laughs> completely. Well, let's make them less and less. That's the idea, I think, yeah. is to reduce, reduce okay. it. I think there's um, some uh, mathematical proofs that contradict what you just said, it's where people simply cannot, can no longer understand the proof itself, although it's supposed to follow clear rules. But nobody is really sure that the, the proof published by, I think, some Russian guy for one of the famous mathematical problems defined in the 18th century, uh, he says he solved it. Oh, well, that was Perman's last theory. Well, theorem. And it has been solved. Sure. It has been solved. Well, Five years if, ago. if nobody can uh, understand the proof, has it been solved? <laughs> right. Um, okay. To start with, I think I think I think we are far away from the complexities of you know mathematics. I mean, we are all dealing with past societies. We do live in a society. We have a little bit of an idea how it's well, going on. Back to the mentioning of the black box. But uh, I understand uh, this, this very idea of the black box. Uh, I don't like the expression black box. Mm -hmm. It's a box that cannot be translated into <coughs> uh, verbal language. So we have plenty of times that there is a mechanical explanation that the engineers understand perfectly well how this computer works. But I'm not in physics, I'm not in computer engineering, I don't understand in which way electricity arrives here and transforms into fancy images. Is this a black box? For me, yes, but for the computer engineer producing this machine, it's not a black box. And this is the real matter in archaeology and social sciences. So what we need is to understand the mechanics, the social mechanics that each is involved, and then find the proper way to express this very complex and usually complicated mechanism. Probably you need a specialist in a language because it's so complicated that it's impossible to translate into verbal language. And here comes the black box idea. So, it's a question of language. So I would like to op like open a question of, we already had one suggestion. What do you think do we need to do in order to actually to make simulation and modeling a more <coughs> common technique. Where do you think the hurdles are? What should we, you know, what are the next steps? We have the teaching. Yeah, that, and that's what I was going to say. We really need to work on teaching. And, and think about how to teach and who to teach. Um, because I'm pretty sure 
uh, you know, I, I really like my students a lot, but I, there's most of them are not going to successfully write simulations. They might be able to successfully you know, manipulate and sort of use simulations someone else writes. Um, but we really have to think about exactly, you know, what do we teach, who do we teach to what level. And I think that's, I don't know that I have the answers. I And uh, last week I went in and taught my, uh, some of my graduate students about agent-based modeling, which I hadn't really planned to do, and I kind of thought they wouldn't get it. Um, but I just went in and sort of started the, the models, some of the simple models in that, that logo model library, and they, they really got excited about, you know, the, yeah. the wolves eating the sheep and the, you know, that kind of stuff. And then we sort of moved from that idea yeah. um, into actual archaeological examples. Mm -hmm. And I think that worked pretty well. I still don't think any of them are going to write the most information. So yeah. Maybe some of them will Well, it them. exists uh, no. an annual summer school on social simulation. Mm -hmm. And we are more or less in combination with the European Social Simulation Association. And one idea is to advertise people well. This year will be a summer school. I think this year is in Groningen in September. Last year was in Barcelona. Every year there is one uh, summer school in social simulation. That's one week. We can follow the same idea and we can organize that in parallel with CAA, for instance. So the first week or the second week, we can organize a summer school. If you need something much more developed than a single workshop at the beginning of the conference, this is an idea. And the other idea will be this drop-in session. But I come from a kind of drop-in session. It was a, a meeting with social scientists, physics, computer scientists, and they decided, please, archaeologists, suggest a problem. Oh, did they, they, they said they were going to pay for it. <laughs> can they say that? So we can begin to circulate that email, asking to archaeologists, is there anyone who has all the data and the proper questions to be simulated and accept to be involved in that? And then we are looking for the computer specialists, for the modelers to contribute to this people. We began in CAA, well, there is a coffee break, there is a wonderful city, go to a bar, think an, an Italian ice cream, and began to discuss your model. And next year we will be, we will see the rest. There's an idea of beginning to integrate people. If we know the computer specialists and the archaeologists, <coughs> we can try to connect both communities. I would also like to defend the students. I'm pretty sure they're smart enough to figure out NetLogo. <laughs> yeah, NetLogo is pretty easy to figure out. But still, <laughs> there, there's more to it than just figuring out the problem. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I think one of the issues might be that uh, Talking about the experience with GIS, uh, yeah, probably the issue is also that you need to be able to solve relatively simple or concrete things with it in order to win the hearts of the archaeologists. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it's a major issue with a lot of computing techniques. They tend to be very, very yeah. abstract to the non-initiated, and it's something that you see with other specialists mm -hmm. in archaeology as well, who knows everything about all the analysis. Mm -hmm. Nobody. So yeah, you have to show that they can come to grips with it relatively so they do their problems if they work with it and then I think you want the momentum. I, I do hope so because uh, I think if we all can deal with ArcMob we can go and build a simulation no problemo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think something to, to build on that, something that uh, can help is, is being shown so the potentials of, of what you can do with it. If, uh, using GIS as the example again, that there's a lot of people who don't use GIS at all and they'll have very strange ideas about what you can do and can't do with it because they're not familiar with it. So they might think something that's actually very simple to do is really complex and hard. You know, you produce a, a dot on that, you know, figure. You're like, this is amazing! How did you possibly do that? And you're like, <laughs> and but then something that's actually really difficult to do, they think, well, this must be quite <coughs> Surely you can knock yeah. that out in an afternoon, and you're like, ah. <laughs> and the the idea of getting more people to get into using simulations and, and the systems, I think, can work the same way. If you're doing, if it's something really new to you, yeah, if absolutely. you get a little bit of familiarity with it, you'll suddenly yeah. realize there's a lot of things you can use it for. That if you, that you haven't, that hasn't occurred to you yeah. that you can do this. Well, I, I'm not a lecturer. If anyone has any offers, then uh, please see me after. <laughs> um, but 
yes, I think one of the thresholds will be getting simulation into the standard curriculum of uh, computational archaeology. And I think that will change the game significantly. Um, Hopefully. <coughs> Hopefully so using so mathematics and statistics <coughs> really difficult into the domain of archaeology with all these real dynamic techniques of programming and we need to. Because in our university it's uh, considered that archaeology should learn Latin and Greek before <laughs> mathematics. So it's a question. Of course archaeology is multidisciplinary, but we should learn too many things. From physics, chemics, geography, uh, computers, uh, we need specialization, but we need questions. So it's a question that um, the archaeologists should participate, but should lead the project, because the question to be solved is archaeology. And what we need is that uh, archaeology lose this shy nature, that I know I'm the poor archaeology, I don't understand that. Please, computer specialists, do all the job. But it is exactly the opposite. So the archaeologists say, I want to do that. Please help me in doing that. Problem with uh, the archaeologists going to the computer scientists and saying, you know, getting the computer scientists to do that is the fact that it's the archaeologist who has the understanding of the theory behind it. And if you want simulation to be middle range theory, then the archaeologist has to do both ends of it as well. Yeah, um, I, I've seen it quite a few times where. Uh, well, I mean, this is a standard multidisciplinary problem where uh, you have two specialists and they both just shut their brain because, oh, the mathematician will deal with that. It's fine. I don't have to think about it, even if it looks quite weird. No, I think uh, we are uh, coming into that phase where we are. <coughs> I, it's, it's surprising how little you need to know in order to be able to engage really well with, with computer scientists, with mathematicians, with statisticians. So. And we've done it before. I mean, it's not the first time. <coughs> I would like to add that... Uh, no, not the computer scientists will tell us. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. The thing is that a, a computer scientist, it's not, it's not a science then. Eh? And we don't, we don't right. have that. No, we have no field of expertise. We just work for other people. So it's not difficult to talk to a computer scientist because he is trained for that. So there is no problem. <coughs> the thing is that a computer scientist works for all these other disciplines, but in archaeology, an archaeologist works with all these other disciplines. And I think there is, a, there is an advantage, there is a match. And um, that's why I think that uh, if, if NetLogo is so easy to teach, at least to some students, I think that there is an opportunity, and what Philip said, uh, find these simple um, well, applications of simulations. Uh, once once these archaeologists come with these questions to solve with simulation, I think there is the cooperation that needs to, to grow into a library of applicable simulations. And I think there's an opportunity to create that here. Um, I don't think we want to keep you here forever, but I do want to point out that we'll be, we'll be voting for the creation of the special interest group. And uh, I remember your names <laughs> and your faces, <laughs> and I know where you live. <laughs> so whoever was here <laughs> and votes against it, <laughs> Polish Matia will come after you. <laughs> um, I think, well, what, what is what is <coughs> there is a need, um, and so we can just as well do it. Um, which uh, brings us to the logistics. Also, I would like to say again, the, the kind of special interest, interest group, we kind of count people as members the moment they're on the mailing list. If they don't want to be on the mailing list, but they want to be members, that's fine, but then uh, you'll just never get an email from us, so <laughs> we're going to be very um, honorary. Um, uh, I so think from the perspective of PCA, you would like them to be members of CAA. Well. Yeah, right, pay your 15 quid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely, please do. Um, however, <laughs> just send me your email. <laughs> so please do get in touch in that respect. If, if you feel like, for example, your university would like to run a workshop on, on IBM, and you can pay my flight, I am happy to come. <laughs> Especially if you live in Southern Europe, that's uh, <laughs> even better. <laughs> we have already organized a wonderful course on NetLogo. There's plenty of examples, so if you accept that, we can go. 
with a suitcase with all the examples and all the materials. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's the teaching bit. Um, if you feel of developing a, a model or you feel you know somebody who, who would like to do that, these do point them to the mailing list. One of the one of the reasons we have it is that we can we can then match uh, the people that start and need some help with people that have you know been in the business for a while. Um, and the same if you feel like you want to collaborate with other people, yeah, please do see us and uh, join the mailing list. And uh, hopefully something will come out of it. The idea will be minimum for next year for next CA conference to have. A part of a session, a long session, not just uh, one of these small conferences in CAA about simulating the past, trying to integrate all different ideas and connections, <coughs> more or less in cooperation with the European Social Simulation Association. And we will secret among us, among you, the idea of a workshop, a longer workshop, a longer uh, summer school or Eastern school, because it's depending on CAA. <laughs> if uh, you agree that, we can speak with the local organizers of next CAA for organizing that. During, not during the CAA dates, but in parallel, more or less the idea of the Connecting the Past conference. So we can organize two days for a deep workshop on teaching materials and teaching approaches mm -hmm. for system uh, We could also organize a uh, workshop for modelers where we discuss where we're going further on, uh, what would we like to see, where do we think, think the, the main problems are at the moment, and uh, yeah, how do we want to proceed as a one unified front to bring simulation to the mainstream archaeology. And I think um, that's yeah, we will we'll conclude. Thank you so much for coming, so many of you, even though it's beautiful outside and we're in a lovely place. Thank you for our, to our speakers, that, that, was, that was fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for your input. Um, and uh, yes, please do see us, please do vote yes in the end. And, uh, and please go and simulate. And don't listen to <laughs>